lesson number seven, understanding conversion. You know, I admit right off the bat that this is a fairly controversial lesson because it's not something that we really want to talk about. What is real conversion? It's almost like opening up a can of worms. What does it take for someone to be saved? But listen, in evangelism, it's critical that we understand what real conversion is. Again, if you'll take a moment and, and get out your manual here to, to chapter 7, you'll realize that at the very beginning, I've listed Romans 10, 9 and 10, where at least the vast majority of the Protestant church is going to base their understanding of what real salvation, real conversion is all about. The Bible says here that if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You know, the Bible couldn't be much more clear on this. If I'll confess Jesus is the Lord of my life, not just that I believe he's a savior, not just that I believe 2,000 years ago he died on a cross, but if I'll actually make him the Lord of my life and believe that God raised him from the dead. You see, Jesus is not just a dead religious figure. He's alive. He's the living son of God. And when I reach out to him in simple faith and I say, Jesus Forgive me of my sin, and I make you the Lord of my life. It's a commitment and a decision that God honors, and that literally I pass from death to life. Well, today I want to study an example of a young man who, for many of us, would have been, uh, we, we, couldn't have, we couldn't have imagined Jesus botching up this opportunity the way that he did. And I want you to know something. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And if we will understand real conversion, our study today is going to help us tremendously, not only in our evangelism, but in our discipleship. Let me ask you just a, a quick sort of rhetorical question. Is it possible to make a disciple out of someone who's not really even a convert? Someone who's never even really committed their life to Christ? And yet that's exactly what we're trying to do in many, many of our churches. And we wonder why the evangelism doesn't really work as well as it should, or as well as we think it should. And yet I'm here to tell you that if someone doesn't make a heartfelt commitment to Christ, to make Jesus the Lord of their life, you'll never be able to disciple that person. In fact, the very next day you try to even reach out to them and engage them in a phone call or go and visit them, they're not even going to most likely even be open to it. Now here's what happens in so often, um, you know, a situation. I would say that much of the modern church, and I've written this here, teaches and practices that as long as someone believes in Jesus, that they're saved and they're right with God. Well, listen, I don't want to burst your bubble, but Satan believes in Jesus. Muslims believe in Jesus. In the sense that they believe he lived sometime in the past. They're not really sure what they believe about him, but they, they believe in him. Let me tell you something. Jesus is Lord is not the same as just believing that Jesus existed one time in the past. We have to ask ourselves, is making Jesus the Lord of our lives really necessary? In the modern church age, I would say that we've sort of divided the human race into three groups. And I've listed them here. Those that are lost, and that's, you know, more than 80% of our population in the world today. Number two would be the really committed, the serious Christians. We'd have a third group that we would call the carnal Christians or people that believe in Jesus but have never grown. They've never matured. They've never become any different than they were the day that we, quote, unquote, prayed with them a sinner's prayer. 
Again, without opening up or wanting to open up some can of worms we can never really deal with, let me ask you something. Do you really believe it's okay to pray a prayer, to respond to an altar call and say, God, forgive me, and yet never change your life at all? And then truly think that person's born again or changed. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. And yet for so many Christians, you know, back in the decade of the 90s, uh, a major, major Protestant denomination had this emphasis on how we were going to win as many people as we possibly could to Jesus. And in this denomination, more than 30,000 people, quote-unquote, were born again. And yet, as a result of the end of the decade, less than 1,500 had ever joined a local church. 30,000 people and less than 1,500 ever joined a local church. See, I want you to understand this, and ambassador, and at Ambassadors for Christ, we, we teach that it is not enough to just talk someone into praying a prayer, and that much of what happens in evangelism is we come up with these clever ways of presenting Jesus where if someone just says, yes, 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 or they would even shake their head and say, uh-huh, I believe in this, and uh-huh, I believe in that. That doesn't make someone a Christian. And I'll say this, if, if we talk about discipling new converts, if they're not converted, it's going to literally be impossible. There is no such thing as the carnal Christian, the Christian that, that isn't interested in making Jesus Lord, but just wants to make Jesus Savior. You can't find anything like that in the Bible. And today I want you to turn with me to, to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to do for about the next 15 minutes just a very brief study. Again, if I was there in a church, I would, I'd probably spend 45 minutes to an hour trying to make sure that everybody really understands this study, because for me it's one of the most foundational and important studies in the Word of God. I think we all know what happens. There's a a rich young ruler is how it's usually phrased if you look at the headings in your Bible. This young man runs up to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do that I may inherit eternal life? If we were honest, most of us on the streets or in a church service, if someone came up and said, How do I get saved? How do I have eternal life? You know what most of us would ask him? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you willing to admit that you're a sinner? Would you believe that Jesus died for sinners? Would you pray with me and call upon him and make him your Savior? You and I both know that almost in any church in North America, we would put somebody through a series of questions. What do you believe? And Jesus never did that one time in the entire gospel. And then you know what we'd say with him if he could say, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. We would say, pray this prayer after me. Does Jesus do that with this young man? Think about this, guys. This is critical. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be a Christian? You see, I want to help you today in your evangelism. It's not about just talking someone into praying a prayer, only to have them never ever Go any farther in God than that one experience. That's not real conversion, and that's not real Christianity. Could you imagine what Jesus says to this young man? I have this whole thing listed on page 46 in your manual here. Jesus brings up the commandments of all things. Boy, most of us, and certainly most of us in the grace and faith and, and churches that, that aren't just trying to hammer someone with the law, how on earth could Jesus blots us up so badly as to bring up the commandments? Well, he's not botching it up at all. The young man says, after Jesus goes through a whole list, he says, all these I've kept from my youth up. 
Look at, I have it highlighted here. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, there's one thing you lack. Could you imagine that? It's not enough just to pray a prayer. Jesus doesn't say, pray with me. Jesus says, there's one thing you lack. And notice what it is. Go and sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven, he said, and come and follow me. Come and follow me and take up your cross. Could you imagine that? It wasn't enough for Jesus just to say, pray this prayer. Believe in me. Believe that I am Lord. Jesus actually puts his finger on the real idol in this young man's life. He says, one thing you lack, go and sell it all. Give it all away. Give it to the poor. Let me ask you real quick. How many people does Jesus make this requirement of in the gospel? There's one tie. When this young man comes up to Jesus, ready to flatter a religious leader, he knows exactly how to butter up these rabbis. Oh, good master, what do I need to do to have eternal life? It's interesting. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. And you know the commandments. Why would Jesus point out one thing in this, young man, in this young man's life, that he needs to sell all that he has and give it to the poor. Let me ask you, what do you think the real idol is in this young man's life? It's his material wealth. It's his possessions. It's all of his goods. You know, Jesus only told 12 other men, come and follow me. Could you imagine this? Jesus is inviting this man to be Judas's replacement. And yet this young man, his heart is so captured by his stuff, by his money, by his possessions, that he's unwilling to actually get this idol out of his life. Now think about that for a minute. What is real conversion? And again, I have a whole study here. I hope that you'll take the time and to go through these notes and, and, and to learn from Jesus himself. How Do you really believe, how many of you know Jesus knew what he was doing and bringing this man to a real commitment and a real decision? And unfortunately so, a decision this young man isn't willing to make. Jesus is trying to save his soul. Jesus isn't trying to make it hard on him. As long as his possessions have his heart, he'll never, ever walk with God. You know what this young man is really wanting? Jesus to bless his life. He's not willing to give up his life and to come and really follow Jesus. And again, this begs the question, what is real conversion? What is a real decision? Could you imagine Jesus starting at the starting point in his conversation with this young man? It's God, and it's God's commandment, and it's God's holiness. This young man is so self-deceived that he could honestly say, I've kept all the commandments from my youth up. What a lie. You know what commandment this young man has never kept? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This young man is guilty of absolute idolatry, of putting his possessions and his stuff before God, and Jesus is trying to get him to be real and honest and to deal with the idol in his life. And see, this is what real conversion is. No longer am I living for myself, doing my thing my way. Real conversion is that I'm stopping and I'm turning from my previous life so that I can turn to Jesus and make him the Lord of my life. You see, for Matthew at the tax collector's booth, when Jesus says, come and follow me, Matthew can't do both. 
when Jesus says to Peter at the side of, of the lake, come and follow me, Peter is no longer in the fishing business. <laughs> Peter turns and he gives his whole life. What does he do with this fishing business? Do you remember the story? He leaves the boats and he leaves the nets and he leaves the fish and he leaves everything right there on the side of the lake and he turns and he follows Jesus. You see, what I want you to understand is when we go out and we present the gospel, we're not just presenting, I want you to believe these truths about God, but we're asking people to make a heartfelt commitment. If you look over here on page 49, does, let me ask you, does go and sell all you possess sound like pray this prayer after me? Why do you think it's so hard for us to follow up some of our quote-unquote converts when they've never been converted from themselves to serve the living God even in the first place? You see, I want to encourage you to, to think about what evangelism is. Is it trying to talk someone into believing some facts about Jesus? Or is it actually issuing the challenge to turn your life from what you're doing and how you're living? Does God care what they're doing as far as their sin or, or, or whatever it is? Well, of course, in some sense he does. But what he really doesn't want them to do is just to destroy their lives. So he issues this invitation to the human race to turn from your sin and from yourself. Can you think of what that word is biblically? It's the word repent. Turn from what you're doing so that now you can actually turn to Jesus. It's repentance and faith. Until I repent, until I turn from myself and my ways, I'll never turn to Jesus in simple faith, and make him the Lord of my life. You know, for me, it was, it was 36 years ago that I committed my life to Jesus. Steve no longer is living for himself. And it was just a very short time after that that I went to Oral Roberts University and, and literally made the decision to serve God with all of my life, with all of my heart. It was a heartfelt decision that I made. You know how fast it was for me to give up drugs? I quit like this in a day because no longer is Steve living for himself. I can tell every single person on this planet that since the day I asked Jesus into my heart, he has completely set me free from drugs, from alcohol addiction, from depression and discouragement, and every kind of thing you can think of. God came into my life. I went from living for myself to living for the living God. You see, that's conversion. No longer am I doing what I used to do. The cleaning up of our act is so simple when we make Jesus the Lord of our life. Because it's no longer me doing my thing. Here this rich young ruler simply wants a rabbi to tell him that what he's doing is okay. And it's not okay. It's not okay just to continue to live for yourself and to somehow think that you're going to be saved. Jesus invites us to turn from ourselves and from our ways and from our sin so that we can live our lives every day for the glory of Almighty God. You see, that's real conversion. And go and sell what you possess doesn't sound to me like prayer, prayer. If we want to really help people, we're not going to cheapen the gospel message and somehow we think that that. You know, if I tell them to repent, that's just too hard a message. No, it's not. It's the only thing that will save their soul. And I want you to think about it. What is real conversion? Today, repentance means to feel sorry about something that you're doing. You know what repentance is in the Bible? It's to change the way we live and change the whole direction of our lives. Repentance 
is freedom, not bondage. It's not religious bondage I'm putting people in. It's real freedom to stop living for this world and Satan and ourselves and to turn our affection and our hearts to the living God. Flip over to page 50 in your study. Again, I only have time today to hit some of these highlights, but I, I believe we can, we can get some real understanding here. I put here towards the top of the page, there's a real decision to make and a real commitment required. The rich young man would have quickly and easily made the decision to accept Jesus as long as he could continue to live for himself. That's not Christianity. I can't continue to live for myself and say Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, that means he owns me, he bought me, he's my God, he's my Savior, he's the Lord of my life. I don't just believe, you know, about him, but I live with him and for him every day. And this is the fault in, in much of our evangelism. We believe it's fine just to talk someone into praying a prayer when we've never challenged them to count the cost, to take up their cross, and to walk with God. Listen, I have led thousands of people to Christ without cheapening the gospel into just saying yes to have mental assent to a series of doctrinal facts. Jesus never asked this young man, do you believe in me? Will you pray a prayer after me? The decision is, will you live for me and come and follow me? That's real Christianity, and that's real conversion. And when people are given the opportunity and told the truth, listen, if I'm living a defeated life of failure, I don't want to continue to live that way anymore. And when someone says, you don't have to, Don Payne told me that I could actually turn from my drugs and my sin and myself, and I could turn and live for the living God, and that he would love me and forgive me and accept me and accept my repentance. Do you realize I wanted that in my life? That's real evangelism. And that's real conversion. And guys, this is what we're after. There is no third category about someone who's going to continue to live for themselves and yet at the same time pray a prayer and somehow ask Jesus to save their soul. No, what Jesus asks us to do is to turn from ourselves and to turn to him and to follow him in faith and in love and in obedience. And it's the greatest life there is. Repentance for the rich young ruler is to go and sell what you have and give it to the poor. And yeah, that's really only half the message. Remember what Jesus says after that? Take up your cross and follow me. Turn from what you're doing and come and follow me. Now listen, that's going to result in real conversion. To take up your cross is to voluntarily Give up your old life to die to yourself so that God could raise you up and live for him and his glory. Again, guys, I want you to think about this. The temptation is to go out to the streets, to go out to the parks, to go out and minister to people and to challenge them to believe in Jesus and to pray a prayer. And yet I want you to know Jesus never did that and neither did the apostles. They challenge people to stop living for themselves and to turn their life and their affection to the living God. And if you and I want to really see our churches grow, if we want to see people make a heartfelt commitment to follow Jesus, we're going to stop this, this inch-deep Christianity where we tell people to believe in Jesus, and yet it's okay to go on with your lifestyle and doing your thing, and somehow God's going to bless you. No, God 
Listen, God loves everybody, and God blesses everybody, the lost and the saved. That has nothing to do with it. What we're interested in is real conversion, a real turning from yourself and turning from the destruction in your life. Listen, when I tell people, you know, that, that they could repent and change their life, that's not a bummer. That's the greatest opportunity that they're ever going to hear about. You don't have to go on burying yourself in a bottle or burying yourself in drugs or living this life of absolute depression and selfishness and self-centeredness. What Jesus invites us to do is to stop living the old life and to become a new creation. And isn't that what it really says there in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone's a new creation, all things have become new, the old things have passed away, and all things have become new. How's that going to happen? Well, if I really turn to Jesus and turn from myself, that's exactly what will happen. And you know what, guys? It's real conversion. It's time that we understand conversion. Paul explains it like this in Acts chapter 20, verse 21. He says, I taught you publicly and house to house repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Water baptism should be the measure of how effective our evangelism really is. Not just did they pray a prayer, but did they come to be baptized? In all honesty, in our crusades, I don't count how many people lift up their hand and say they want to pray a prayer. We count how many people actually chose to come and get baptized in water. It's amazing. If we would, if we would begin to, to actually challenge people to turn their lives from their cells and from their ways. And it's exactly like Isaiah says, we all like sheep have turned to our own way and gone astray. You know what conversion is? It's turning back to the living God. Guys, I want to encourage you to take some time and study this lesson and go through it and actually understand what conversion is. Because when we go out and share our faith, please don't make the mistake of just trying to talk someone into praying a prayer, they're more valuable than that. And the price Jesus paid for them is greater than that. There's far too many people with this false sense of, well, I prayed a prayer, that's what the pastor told me to do, or that's what this person told me to do. It's not about praying a prayer. It's about giving your life to God. And I love to tell people, listen, do you really want to get to know him? Are you tired of the religion, tired of the church games? Do you really want to change? Then don't just tell me that you believe in Jesus. It's time to give him your heart, your life, your affection. And I guarantee you, when you do that, and when you present the gospel that way, people will get saved, and they really will be converted. And now you're going to have people to disciple. We're going to talk about that in one of the future lessons. I just want you to know, listen, real conversions happen because that's what the Holy Spirit anoints. The Spirit of God is willing and ready to work with people that understand conversion and aren't afraid to tell people to turn from what you're doing so that you can turn to the living God. And when you go back and study the Bible, you'll see that that's what God did. That's what Jesus did throughout his ministry. Listen, we're out of time today. It's great to have this opportunity to be with you. May God bless you as you reach out and really bring people to Jesus. God bless you.